Fantastic greetings, family. This is Brother Ron, also known as R2C2H2, the Artivist. Today's date, March 9th, 2024. I'm here to commemorate the memory of the righteous ancestors. One Thomas Moss, one Calvin McDowell, one William Henry Stewart, the victims of what became known in history as the lynching at the curve or the people's grocery lynchings of March 9th, 1892. And it's very important to remember this. If we don't tell their stories, the ancestors get no glory. So I'm actually at the actual grave site of Brother Thomas Moss. There's a historic marker, thanks to the National State, I mean, National Park Services, as well as to the work of an unsung true Shiru. Dr. Ernestine Jenkins, brilliant woman and humanitarian. And I'm here because I want to bring attention to what happened to our people. Like I said, we don't tell their stories. The righteous ancestors get no glory. So this happened March 9th, 1892. And what people really don't understand or overstand rather that many of the so-called lynching victims were successful business people, entrepreneurs, people like that. Lynching was not only a form of punishment, but a, a, a tool, a weapon used to keep black folks in our so-called proper places, which is outside of ownership, which when you own stuff, you can control your destiny. You can really determine your fate in a lot of ways. So Thomas Moss, along with his business associates, had a successful business known as the People's Grocery Store, which was located I guess on the curve, it was outside of Memphis, now it's South Memphis, right? And it was in competition with a white grocer across the street because the people's grocery store was not only popular among black people, so-called colored people, but also among whites, Asians, whoever. They had some of the best quality stuff going around, great customer service. So the competition across the street, William Barrett wanted to do a hostile corporate takeover, right? So he got together a white posse of people, including law enforcement and plain clothes, to attack the people's grocery store. No, a lot of other incidents leading up to that event, but I just want to make it short and to the point where the black men were not going. You know, they were not cowards. They were men. So they actually had their own rifle group. They got together at the store to defend the store and the property and whatnot. So they shot into the crowd, these black men with guns, shot into the crowd, allegedly injuring, seriously injuring some uh, white people who happened to be uh, plain clothes police officers or they were police officers in plain clothes. So the black men turned themselves over, Thomas Moss, Kevin McDowell, William Stewart, were the leaders of the business. Thomas Moss was a well-respected leader, period, in the city of Memphis. He was one of the first black letter carriers or postman or mailman in the city so he was well respected and revered by black and whites as well. He was a young family man. He had a beautiful wife and daughter who Ida B. Wells was the godmother to. That was her goddaughter. He had a son on the way when he was lynched. And so these men turned themselves into the proper authorities, so-called proper authorities, law enforcement. They were held in prison and then they were kidnapped from prison and taken to a spot near the train tracks to be slaughtered. These men were mutilated. They were the classic textbook lynching to me, mutilated beyond recognition. Um, Calvin McDowell, William Henry Stewart, they were really badly mutilated. And uh, Thomas Moss was the last to die. So what people don't understand, you actually had the newspapers, leading newspapers, media um, agencies of the day, they pay witness to a crime. They witnessed a crime without intervention. These folks went, witnessed the uh, extrajudicial execution of these men without proper due process. They never had their day in court, really, to defend themselves or whatever to tell their side of the story. So Thomas Moss tried to reason with the people there, the white lynch mob, these white men, these vicious devils. He tried to reason with them, saying that he was a young family man. He had a, a child on the way. So they said, you know, we still going to kill you. And so uh, I believe he was asked his last words and it was recorded by the press who was present at the time, the white press. He basically said, tell my people to go west, 
because they can't get any justice here. Tell my people to go west because they cannot get any justice here. And Adam Wells heard about what his last words were allegedly. She was very distraught about the situation, losing one of her best friends. You know, this she was the godmother to his daughter. He had a son on the way, and uh, he was not going to be able to live to see that son born. And so what Adam Wells did, because she had her own uh, media platform, the Free Speech and Headlight, she advocated for black folks to leave Memphis. She published the last words of so-called last words of Thomas Moss. And over 6,000 black people left Memphis. A lot of them ended up going to Oklahoma Territory and helping start, you know, the Greenwood thing called Black Wall Street. Uh, matter of fact, the most prominent uh, victim of Black Wall Street, the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921, was a Memphian born and raised named Brother Andrew C. Jackson. Dr. Andrew, or A.C. Jackson, was a prominent colored, as they say back in the day, surgeon. Uh, according to the Mayo Brothers, the founder of the Mayo Clinic, the founders of the Mayo Clinic, he was the most accomplished, successful uh, color surgeon in the country. And so that didn't even save him because from my understanding, one of his white neighbors in Tulsa, John Oliphant, who was a former judge and police chief, I believe, I believe his name was John Oliphant, he tried to tell the white mob, don't take this man's life. He's a credit to not only his race, but also to humanity. He saves the lives of both blacks and whites. And Leslie was a white teenager that shot him dead and it kept him moving. So he was just like 42, maybe 42, yeah, about 42 years, 42, 43 years old at the time of his untimely passing. It's Dr. A.C. Jackson. Take a look. It's all online. But anyway, uh... There you have it, folks, and I'm here to pay my respects in my own way, the artist's way. Going to pour out, pour out a little Florida water here. And wrap it up. May the righteous ancestors be pleased.
God bless the dead, man. God bless the dead. If we don't tell their stories, the righteous ancestors get no glory. If we don't tell their stories, the righteous ancestors get no glory. See how it works? Somewhere one.